All right. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Guy McPherson here, and I am very excited to have as my guest today, Uva Duckhorn. Uva, welcome. Wow, it's a pleasure being here with you, Guy. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. So Uva is known as the Lifestyle Liberator. He's delivered over 15,000 two-hour sessions worldwide in the last 12 years. Uva is the founder of the AIM system, that's A-I-M. It's a simple three-step life-changing experience for in-demand professionals and their spouses. They're what he calls the VIPs, the very important partners. He supports them to get back their family mojo, double their financial security, and live in abundance in all areas of their life without feeling guilty or constantly questioning themselves. Uva believes in liberating lifestyles with higher standards and internal certainty that shows up in your business, financially, and emotionally in your relationships. All right, Uva. So first of all, so I was in your podcast a while back. You graciously invited me on, and that's how we met. And you, we'll talk about your podcast, but you really struck me because you your podcast is super short it's like what eight minutes um but it's packed i mean you have this style and this energy about you um and i wanted to bring you on here to share that with my listeners so so welcome <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Thank All right. You. So before okay. before we get going, yeah. Uva, where are you from originally, and where are you currently? Well, originally I'm born in in, in Germany, and uh, also currently I'm in Germany. But of course, I work uh, since more than twelve years uh, internationally, and uh, for North America. Australia and the English speaking world, so to speak, all my clients all over the world, and uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying that. Okay, so let's kind of talk about your journey of sense. How did you get to where you are now? What drove this interest? Well, the, I, I must say that I, I really had kind of like a, a life before this life, so to speak. So it really goes back to, yeah, the early days. So um, as you know, and we talked about this uh, on my podcast. Uh, I was uh, sexually abused uh, at the age of 10 and I never told anybody. So it really starts there, I guess. And uh, so, and over the, the years growing up with my um, family, which I, I really love, uh, it was kind of like, you know, there was always something inside of me that I felt um, that was missing. But I, I had no clue because I couldn't talk about this experience. And so there was always kind of like something missing inside of me. And so uh, as I grew up, you know, you just overcompensate things as mm -hmm. you do. And uh, but it's not something that uh, you see as, as something uh, serious. But over time, it became more serious because I was addicted to alcohol. I even took drugs and uh, really tried to fill something inside of me that I've never thought that I would miss something. But there was this hole inside of me that I tried to uh, compensate. And I really lost everything. I lost get, getting in touch with uh, friends. Um, my because job. of your addiction? Yes, because of the okay. addiction um, and I lost everything. So and uh, when I was 28, I found myself standing at the edge of a bridge. And I was ready to let go. And, you, you know, it's uh, it, it really it was this crystal clear winter night and it was bitterly cold as I was standing there. And I was watching the stars and I even could see my breath and as I was breathing in and out and in that moment, I was kind of like, you know, up to this point, I really believed I cannot feel anything. And the truth was, I couldn't feel anything because I was numb. And so when I was standing there, I did let go. And in that very moment, something happened that, you know, 
I saw this tiny little light inside of me. And then I felt it for the very first time since my father had died bef five years before that, I felt something and this drew me back from jumping. So and I realized something in, in that moment when I was standing there, I just started to cry for, for a very long time because I didn't cry after my dad died. I just started to cry. For, for minutes, for, for I think, I don't know, half, half an hour or so, and realizing that there is something else there. But only after I did let go, I realized that I could feel that there is something else. When you say let go, you don't mean you obviously let go when you jumped off the bridge. Was, yeah. You let go of what? Your, these constrictions, these mental chains, if you will, these conceptions, what? No, this came later, but I mean, in that very moment, I literally leaned forward and was able to let go. But it really kind of like in that second, in that split second, you know, I saw this tiny little light and I felt something. And this feeling drew me back. So there was nothing else. It was pitch black, you know, kind of like the, really a tunnel vision. And it really was focused on, okay, this is, this is the end. Mm. So, and this was the turning point uh, in my life when I was 28. And I promised myself, you know, something in, in, in that night that I will um, live a life with all the, the emotions uh, there are in this. Uh, I don't want to use drugs any longer to be dependent on anything. And so, and this really started my journey into personal development. And 20 years later to the lifestyle liberator mm -hmm. I'm today. So, but there, there's, there's more to that um, because from that experience that I, ex that I, I lived through that, in that moment, I realized that letting go is only 50% of the equation. And letting in is the other side of the equation. So it's kind of like it's a it's kind of like a two-part mechanism inside of us. Letting go and letting in, it's like a two-part mechanism that we have, but mm -hmm. we're not aware of. And only after I did let go, I realized, oh, there's something else. And this realization just dawned on me over the years and until I really could um understand it and uh, exercises in a way that now I help my clients to learn this, mm -hmm. to help really, as you in, in, in a similar uh, way, I guess, uh, with your clients do with trauma, help them with trauma or any um, extraordinary incident they experienced in the past. Like me, I was uh, believing I cannot feel, you know, just really truly believing I cannot feel mm -hmm. and there are thousands of other beliefs like that I'm not good enough I don't belong or whatever it is and what I do is is really helping my clients to get to that island I call this the the core elephant uh, so to speak I call this the elephant thinking effect so and it's kind of like something that you experienced and uh, you react or first you know you had this extraordinary incident and then you know as a reaction to it you programmed yourself with something like i can't feel i don't belong or whatever it is and that is just the beginning of you know a sequence of other elephant thinkings that evolve into patterns and mm -hmm. these patterns of our life to uh, evolve into our behavior. Well, let me, so, let me interrupt if oh, I may for a sorry. second here. So you're, you know, you were standing on that bridge. You said you were 28. So prior to that time, Uva, did you, you, know, you said you were using drugs and alcohol, not feeling, um, was there a sense or realization that 
what had happened to you, the abuse that happened to you, that that had impacted you at all? When no. did that awareness come yeah, about? Good, 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 good point. Um, so that happened um, afterwards. So that realization about uh, um, my, uh, you know, that I was sexually abducted is uh, not abducted, uh, abused. Uh, was that came after, you know, I did let go and obviously didn't jump um, because I, I went into therapy and uh, I was there for three months in, in, in therapy and we did a, an, a special, you know, an intensive uh, with, you know, with role plays and so they were kind of like the whole group, I think it was 30, 30 other um, uh, people also in this group and uh, we did uh, role plays and one of the uh, the ladies was um, raped and we had the um, task to turn our, our faces towards the wall we were all sitting in a circle around her in the center where she was laying on on cushions and everything and so we had to turn ourselves around and we had to moan and I just get the shivers again because in that moment when I heard that moaning, I wanted to throw up. Wow. I ran out of this circle up because it was in the cellar up into the garden and just throw up. So, and this was the moment I realized what's going on here. This was the first time I really realized there's something else and that started my whole additional process of dealing with what happened talking about it and actually starting to do therapy mm -hmm. because until that point you know kind of like what, what does it mean to, <laughs> to do therapy mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know so I, I, I'm, I have problems with feeling stuff and uh, still after the effect but um, I could feel I, I, I was willingly going to support myself, to take care of myself in that moment. But this is how the, the, the story really started. Wow. Um, bef before we kind of move on here, what was the purpose of the moaning? Um, to induce an, 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 an environment so that she could relive Wow. This moment, these, these moments, but it had an effect directly on me. I'm sure it did. And other people too. Unconsciously, that yes. just sounds very intense. Okay. Um, so you, you're in a sense, there, there seem to be almost these with us all many threads that, that brought you here. Hmm. Um, to where you are now and what you're doing now, how has that experience and, and how you've moved through that, how has that informed the work you're doing now? Mm. No, um, absolutely. So it's, uh, it helps me up until today. So it's uh, because of this very, well, let's say straight, intensive extraordinary experience i and also supporting myself in i want to feel everything as life is kind of like opening up to all the the emotions there are no matter what happens mm -hmm. because of that mantra also it's kind of like when i uh, finally uh, started out as a as a coach you know it helped me en enormously because I can feel if someone uh, is, even if it's on Zoom, you know, of course I, I started out on, 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 on as, we, as we did on Skype very early on online, but also offline, but I could, I always could sense and have that internal um, reaction to if some, something feels right, feels true when I'm um, with someone together. So that always helped me kind of like mm -hmm. part of my superpower. I don't know. Uh, how I would describe it, it's uh, I can feel if someone um, is at a moment internally reflecting, experiencing um, at the core of his problem or their problems. 
So if they're not there, because I'm German, I'm thorough, um, I just keep asking questions. And that's what I do as a systemic coach. So I really want to get there so they can feel and perceive as I did. Only, you know, after I did let go, I was able to feel and perceive something else that was there. Right. 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 So that so helped me a lot to, to really uh, be there in the moment and to, to exercise what I do. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I love what you're saying about your superpower is this ability to like trust yourself and trust your instincts and trust your guts such that you can feel and sense if someone is in the essence of what their their problem their crossroads in a sense that's pretty cool yes i, that's, I believe that's, so. <laughs> that's really cool so yeah. you said to yourself so what how did this unfold you said to yourself i want to work with people to help them do what? How did you get to that point where you created this business? Well, it, it just was slowly, really. So, you know, I'm, it's kind of like 14, 14 years ago. It wasn't earlier. So there was a, a period of time where I, I just worked and uh, I was uh, still in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a lifestyle business, nightlife business, um, still in contact with uh, my former life, but um, not using drugs or alcohol any longer. But, you know, then I was became regional manager of uh, an, uh, an agency and uh, we were kind of like in the early 2000s. So we had this, uh, uh, it's called, it was called night agents. We just went out with, uh, uh, and in a time where Smartphones didn't exist, you know, we went into the club scene in Berlin and uh, with these little cyber shot cameras and we made pictures, you know, uh, polarizing pictures, of course, we went in all, all these clubs uh, exist and uh, then we uploaded them at night and then uh, people started to commenting on them. So, and uh, I was the manager to, um, we, our business model was to uh, do advertisement for these clubs and so therefore they got the pictures and everything so but at one point you know the the the, the, the spreadsheets became bigger and bigger and uh, the the mother company uh kind of like it dawned on me so i was uh, beginning in my 40s so i was like yeah i think i if i don't switch or you know find something that is still missing inside of me finding really like my true purpose why am i here i was still asking myself who am i uh why am i here and what do i love to do mm -hmm. so i had this strong understanding of myself and support in a way but that kind of like also tipped me off to say okay and i went for for a sabbatical and uh, i was in taking up different programs and i landed in a assist, uh, as a, in a systemic coaching program so where they also train to to be a trainer trainer but also systemic coaching and then we had coaches and they were fantastic they're doing stuff with us i've never experienced before so that was the first time i was encountering coaches and what they do and i loved it and i essentially really what resonated the most with me was helping people um, to uh, how, uh, to discover their um, perceptions, to, to, to really guide them through to, so they can find their, what's really going on. And this really resonated with me and it was so strong. But at the end of the program, <laughs> I decided not to work as a systemic coach because I had too much respect of helping other people to find their perception per, uh, to, to, to find their way and their truth. And so I started out as a trainer and I, I did uh, things uh, like uh, visual thinking, bringing that into the German market, translated from the English at that time already, working with uh, project management teams um, with, uh, with the military in Germany and uh, corporate and so on. It was quite successful, but there was one piece always missing. Mm. You know, when you work with a group, it's that piece. So 
at the end of the day, they all have to jump over the so-called wall, training wall. Everybody has to be over there and then your training was successful. And there were some, you know, they needed some more att attention than others. And I always resented that. I felt like, yeah, I, I wish I had more time for them. So and then lucky me, uh, my one of my former coaches in my program where, where I was, you know, reached out to me and said, hey, Uwe, um, why don't you uh, join us here? I'm uh, getting a job as a director of this academy and uh, I want you there. You have a background in marketing. I come, come in. And so I finally find my, found myself in a position one-on-one -on -one because I had all the first conversations. Everybody, 360 degrees of people were coming in daily. Mm -hmm. And I had this one-on-one -on -one conversations and I was really stunned that one simple question, the answer to one simple question. So what are your goals? So, you know, and only 15% um, had an idea and they were really all through the spectrum. Doesn't matter mm. if they were academics or just in between jobs. No, no, only 15% had that. So I used, you know, of course, my learned coaching skills to ask them questions. I used also something from uh, visual thinking uh, on one sheet. I gave them kind of like something into their hands. So they had a five, the next five year strategy where they want to go. And having that, I could say, OK, so this is where you want to go. And how can we help you to get there? So therefore, my conversion rates as a also kind of like um, the first uh, consult, sales consultant uh, for, for, the, for the academy were skyrocketing. So I had so much uh, success, the, the people loved it. So um, increasing profits uh, in the first year for more than 30%. Wow. And, uh, and it, it really kind of like, you know, doing this every day of the day after day, eight people, 12 people. And, and these conversations, these initial conversations, they got even longer. They started out as 20 minute uh, 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 talks, conversations, and then they became 40 minutes and even longer. And, and again, it was winter again, but this time I was inside <laughs> and it was warm inside. And it really dawned on me. And I was, I was just sitting there at the end of, a, of such a day. It was really fulfilled with what I've done. And I was just like, Uwe, what are you doing here? You're using coaching skills. You're using coaching questions. Why don't you just step into the role and identity of a coach? And Gusband Schauer, again, click in that moment. I just, it just fell all into place mm. and I was there and I knew that's me. That's who I am. That's what I love to do. And that's why I'm here. So I had the answers to my three questions and this really kickstarted me uh, to where I'm in today. Let me just remind everyone that I'm speaking with Uva Dockhorn. His website is uvadockhorn.com. That's U-W-E-D-O-C-K-H-O-R-N.com. Um, so, all right, we're kind of winding down here, but I, I want to ask you some stuff. So who would you say is your ideal client in a sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm specialized. I started out working with uh, business owners, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, executives. Uh, it developed to C-suite executives, to medical professionals. And at one point it done, you know, I realized that there is a, there's a, a dangerous dynamic shift in the relationships of these in demand professionals and these high achiever families, because, you know, the, you know, I typically started out with coaching the provider, so to speak, of the family. And then, you know, the spouse said, oh, I love what you do, do with my husband uh, or spouse. You know, I would like to be that you are my coach, too. And I said, yes, of course. Lucky me. So but then I realized also that there's a, this, this imbalance in their relationship. So the providers up here and very often, too often, the spouse at home feels kind of like abandoned, asking themselves, what about me? What's the next step in my career? And so, you know, 
they don't see this consciously, but it's there, it's growing and they cannot grab it. So, and that was, was the point where I started to realize, oh, I, I can tap and help them. And this is what differentiates me out also from, from other systemic coach, coaches. So, because I coach them, I'm not a family counselor, I coach them separately. And I help them to gain and often regain their independence within their relationship and then regularly bring them together and they love these sessions. These are goosebump sessions uh, times 10 uh, mm -hmm. because they finally can level up to each other again with a deeper connection to each other and really getting to that eye to eye respectful, intimate uh, relationship that they so much love. Mm. And so this is really the culmination of over the years. And uh, this is what I love to do now and helping get back their family mojo and even double their financial security. And that means that typically because these spouses at home, they don't trust themselves enough to be even successful or to, to run their own business sometimes because they feel guilty or questioning themselves you know also against their kids depending on how old the kids are you know they don't believe that they are up there for you know bringing in income so that's kind of like where I also come in and help them to uh, gain their trust and um, find something so they can participate in bringing in additional money to the family therefore doubling the financial security for the whole family. So that's also coming back to that uh, eye to eye relationship again. So they don't feel like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling behind. I, I don't want that. Right, right. Awesome. All right. So as we kind of wind down here quickly, um, you have a podcast, talk a little bit about your podcast. Yeah, well, you should talk about the podcast. You've been a guest on it. So I it's have, called, yeah. <laughs> it's Lift Off with Energizing Results. And, lift, um, lift Off with Energizing Results. Lift Off okay. Okay. With, with Energizing Results. And uh, currently uh, recorded today, 63rd episode already. Nice. And it's, uh, as I said, short and sweet format. It's uh, six questions in nine minutes. And uh, my favorite one is at the end. Uh, as you remember, it's the question about um, when was the last time you experienced goosebumps with your family and why? And uh, this is so important because it's, as the name says, lift off with energizing results. So I want to, you know, listeners to come to the podcast and feel at the end. They got informative, insightful shares of my guests, of course, but at the end, really to end on a high note, emotional high note, having a goosebump, having a goosebump shower. So I'm really an advocate for more goosebump showers in the world. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, Uwe, it was awesome talking with you today. And I really appreciate you sharing, you know, your story and um, walking us through how it led you to where you are today and what you're doing today and it's 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 super inspiring thank you thank you so much for having me it was it was really a pleasure being here today with you. awesome awesome all right take care sir thank you bye